Yep. So, um, if anybody's actually smitten with the lean concept, uh, I've been talking to Sean about uh, the community of practice holding a, uh, an event here in GMIT. So he's working on that at the moment and uh, we'll keep you posted um, through CIF and the professional groups. Uh, we're willing to do a workshop or something here in uh, an evening. Um, the next speaker is um, uh, John Einan. John is director of... Uh, Eddie, someone up with you? Just go on, no, okay. uh, so John is the director of Open Water Consulting. Uh, Limited, his own consultancy company. John's an experienced design and construction professional, having qualified as an architect in 1981. He's worked in the public and private sectors in architectural practice and, and uh, also in con contracting on projects and frameworks valued from 1 million up to 1 billion. Uh, he's a member of the CIOB Faculty of Architecture and Surveying Board, the Innovation Research Board, and the Low Carbon Strategy Group in the UK. Uh, John would crop up very regularly at seminars and, um, and in publications in the UK giving comment on the actual uh, development of lean, uh, sorry, the development of BIM in the UK, lean on the brain, <laughs> probably, John. Uh, today, today um, John's flown in from the UK to be with us, so we're thanking for his efforts uh, on that score. And he'll update us on progress in the UK towards their uh, BIM agenda for 2016. Good morning. Uh, firstly, just to say uh, it's great to be here again. I was here a couple of years ago and uh, it's been really good to be back and just see that uh, things are a bit more positive now and uh, life is getting better. I'd just like to firstly subscribe to what Martin said about uh, lifelong learning. Um, I think as a, as a professional, we have a duty to keep learning and our industry is one that where we can learn new things every day and uh, you know over, over my career which goes to when the dinosaurs were still roaming the earth the um, you know I've picked up some qualifications and all sorts of stuff along the way and at the grand old age of 58 I'm about to embark on a PhD which will probably keep me going until I'm retiring so uh, so there we go secondly um, just an interesting point and I think uh, just to bear in mind, the perspective I'm giving is a UK perspective, so I make no apology for that because you asked me to speak, so that's what I bring. Um, I don't really know the situation over here. But I think one of the issues that you face over here as well as we do in the UK is the perception of the industry. And to be honest, if you're into demographics and the Generation Y, Generation Z, Millennial thing, then you'll understand what I'm talking about is that simply is the sorts of pictures of the men in suits, and I'm aware that I am one of the men in suits, are those the best images to try and implore young professionals to join the industry? That's an open question. You can work it out for yourself. And thirdly, just to pick up on Lean and BIM, um, if you do follow BIM in the UK, Ministry of Justice is one of the leading protagonists of BIM and lean construction and lean planning and last planner and all that sort of stuff has informed their procurement and delivery processes for a number of years and they, brought, they were able to bring forward the BIM target from 2016 to 2013 for level two partly because their planning and procurement processes are built on lean anyway and what they're doing is using BIM um, processes and technologies to take advantage of what some of the things they already have in place. So if you look at the Cook and Wood case study, for instance, they save 800k on a 20 million pound project in terms of capex, and they've made significant savings on the FM operation, partly through BIM, partly through Lean. So, so Lean is alive in the UK. You know, don't, it's not just about what the institutes or the groups are doing. There are people out there actually doing it and it's embedded in their processes. 
Okay, let's crack on. So this is me. If you want to find out any more about me and what I do, uh, it's on my website there. Um, unfortunately, Eddie Tuttle, who is the um, Head of Policy and Public Relations for the CIB, who is with me today, way of poor Eddie, Eddie's had a sudden attack of laryngitis. So I'm, I'm doing his slides, Eddie, for him. Uh, so there we go. Um, the, uh, basically, in terms of what the CIB are doing, it may not be grabbing the headlines, but we're beavering away on a number of things, particularly in terms of positioning and leadership industry, um, in, certainly in terms of the UK BIM programme. Uh, we've got a very close relationship, working relationships with the leaders of the BIM task group. Um, we're working very closely with business, business innovation and skills. We're, we are now the secretariat for all the BIM, for, BIM 4 groups and we collaborate with them and uh, provide some focus and strategy. And we're part of C8, which is the um, sort of nascent um, grouping of all the leading professional institutes in the UK. And we're contributing to develop the UK and global strategy uh, for BIM from the UK and also in terms of legacy arrangements as well. It may not be growing the headlines at the moment, but the CIB is definitely in the mix. Um, a rather odd thing just to point out, we were asked to mention something about the uh, Code for Project Management or Construction Management. Um, just to say the fifth edition was published uh, late last year. Uh, the sixth edition is underway at the moment. It's, uh, it's, there's a group working on it. Um, the fifth edition is BIM ready. You know, in each of the stages, we've put some BIM stuff in there. So key BIM related uh, things that you need to think about or BIM documents you need to have um, in place. I'll just take a quick slur. So for the next um, short while, I'm going to give you uh, BIM, Digital Life and Level 2, and I'd like to thank you for being with me for the next two hours. Um, you're welcome to take notes. So we're going to talk about something I call Digital Life. Uh, I'm going to give you a brief overview of where we are on UK BIM Level 2, and I'm going to leave you with some things to think about. This is me, and as I've said, I do stuff with the CIB, I won't go into it, but involved in a number of industry working groups. I wrote this, you can still buy it on Amazon, and if you do, you'll be contributing to my Caribbean holiday. Uh, I'm currently working on this, which is the CIB BIM handbook. Yes, it does exist. Uh, just, I'm just trying to get it ready to go to the publisher at the moment. Um, it's talking about um, general areas of introduction and interest, and then it's broken down to people, process, and technology, which is a fairly accepted way of thinking about these things. Uh, it's, it's, it's BIM level two centric, basically, uh, so because I think really that's where the action is at the moment. And hopefully, uh, with a following wind, it'll be published by the end of the year. So, we hear about BIM, the train is coming. Uh, is it inevitable? Well, to answer my own question, yes, I think it is. And I would suggest to you that the reasons for it being inevitable actually lie outside of our industry. Whether, whether we're talking about the Irish situation or the UK, UK situation, it doesn't matter. Whatever standards you subscribe to or the processes you use, that doesn't matter. What I'm talking about is the digital context of the world we're living in. And that's what does matter. Because it's already fundamentally affected the way you live. Because I imagine we've all got one of these. You know, and they have to be surgically removed these days. You know, we're dependent on these things. So, it is inevitable. Um, what does it mean? For some, the reaction is a bit like these guys here, you know. Um, we can see BIM coming over the hill. And uh, certainly the experience of a lot of people in the UK is, what the, is this about? You know, what have I got to do? What does it mean to me? Have I got to do anything at all? And there are people still even now burying their heads in the sand. They won't spend, they won't think about it, they won't even go to a course. 
Um, but again, I would suggest to you, going back to the train analogy, this isn't something you want to get in the front of because it will run you down. And we'll talk about Darwin a bit later, but uh, we'll, we'll get to that. This is a train you need to get on board. And of course, just when you, th I don't know, anybody here following the level two conversation in the UK? Anybody got a clue what I'm on about here? No, that's great, okay. Um, while we're here, um, how many people here are students? Excellent. How many people are under the age of 20? Great. I'll get to you later. Okay, got some, got some stuff here. So, we've got level two. Level two is the key platform, which I'll explain in a minute when we get to the uh, View Richards wedge. Um, but actually, um, level two isn't it, because literally in the last couple of weeks, this was launched, which is the UK BIM level three strategy. So, as if you haven't got enough to think about, there is now this. It's available as a free download, digitalbuiltbritain.com. And I have to say, if you don't read anything else this weekend, get your mitts on this. This is an awesome piece of work. And what I'm talking about today will inform this as well, because this is absolutely brilliant. Because it puts BIM in context, it puts BIM on a global stage. It puts the construction industry, whether you're in the UK, um, Ireland, wherever, doesn't matter. But it puts us in place in the whole entire jigsaw of the digital information economy. It's an absolutely awesome piece of strategy. And, you know, it's not easy reading. You know, uh, it's not got many pictures in it, but, uh, but it's worth, it, worth a shot. So on your, on your BIM journey, you may be anywhere from thinking, well, what the hell is it about, to you might think you're actually operating at UK BIM level two and anywhere in between. Um, so again, you know, the journey varies. Um, there is, you know, in, in the UK particularly, there is a lot of smoke and mirrors. People say they're doing things. Somebody on LinkedIn thinks they're operating at level five bearing in mind the level three strategy was only issued a couple of weeks ago, so I don't know what they're doing. Um, so, so there's all sorts of misinformation out there. People like to use, a lot of people, UK contractors, have used it as a work winning thing, saying, yeah, we can do this, we can do that, da 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 da. Proof of the pudding is when they get on site and they ain't got, they ain't got a clue what they're up to. Um, you know, so, so, so there's a lot of mixed messages. And the, the way I would characterise this is I think we're in, a, in the BIM swamp at the moment where this stuff is beginning to work through the industry uh, and there will be mixed messages for a while, for several years actually. Forget the 2016 target, it almost doesn't mean anything then. There are lots of people at various stages of the journey. Yes, there are pockets of excellence there are exemplars like Langerorg, Balfabiti, Skanska, probably, you know, people like that, and some smaller guys as well. Some design practices like HOK, Bryden Wood, David Miller, so on. You know, and yes, they're great examples of excellence. But there is a long tail to our industry, and I'm sure it's the same over here. And 95% of people haven't got a clue what this is about. They don't know where to start. They don't know how to implement it. They don't know what it really means. And particularly for SMEs, having just come out of a uh, recession and survived, um, what about investment? What about training? What about support? You know, these are difficult questions that have got to be answered. But first, just a, just a note of caution. This is my friend Archie. Archie is a robot. And Archie reminds us that people are not robots. And I think in the construction industry, we're very good at having our processes, our checklists, our management plans, our execution plans, our implement implementation plans, um, our process software, all sorts. Of, we've got it coming, you know, we've got piles of paper manuals coming out of our ears. Certification, compliance, registration, 
you name it, we've got it. You know, you can pile it up. People are not robots. And I don't care what it says on your programme or your information required schedule or your checklist, but whatever I'm supposed to do in accordance with your process on day X, if I get out of the wrong side of the bed that morning and I've got a thumping headache from a hangover the night before and the wife is giving me grief for something and I've got some bills to pay, you yabbering on about, well, you're supposed to do this today because it's in accordance with my process, I may actually tell you to do something else. And I think this is something, this is a key issue that we forget as an industry is actually successful projects are built by successful teams. Successful teams are made of people working successfully together. And unfortunately, BIM does not do it all for you yet. So it's about people collaborating together. And it's this soft underbelly of the industry that we still need to get to grips with. When we, we, we work in teams and we put teams together every day, but do we really ever consciously think about how those teams actually are going to work together? Do we think about the profiles of the people involved in those teams? Do we think of the personal dynamics? Do we think of the personality types? You know, do, do we think about you know, whether they co cover, say, the Belvin role models, the team models, that sort of thing? Do we actually think about those things? Or is it, oh, Jack's available, he's just come off that job, we'll stick him over there. Because this is a fundamental issue. You know, and we can, we can bang on about process and software and technology and our checklists and our management plans and all our procurement plans and till the cows come home. But it's about people. And it's about how we work successfully together. And we really, really, really need to learn that lesson. So when we're, when we're thinking about people, this is probably more like what we know. Eddie, it's your fault. See, he's accepting it. You know, he's not going to argue with me. But, you know, we're used to the adversarial thing where people fall into their corners, defend their patch, cover their arse, and blame everybody else. You know, this is the reality of the industry we, we work in. We talk about collaboration, we talk about wanting to work together, we talk about frameworks where everybody's nice to each other, but actually, it's great when you're starting off when there's the rosy glow, but when, it, when the going gets tough, that's the real test. You know, do people retreat to the old behaviours, or is there the commitment, particularly from leadership and the empowerment, to stick with it? Because that's the real test. So in terms of people working together, there are all these things that we need to think about. Um, and I won't dwell on it too much, but um, read the BIM handbook when it comes out, because we, we talk about this in a in, uh, quick plug there. But one of, one of the key things to me is leadership. You know, very often new initiatives come in and the leadership of a business or an organisation or an institute even say, oh yeah, yeah, you get on with it. And then as soon as things again get difficult, the leadership have disappeared up over the hill and you're left to sort it out. You know, leadership commitment and support to, to drive through those obstacles, to break down those barriers, to work across the silos is key. And if our industry is ever going to change, it needs leadership to stand up and be counted and put their sensitive parts on the block. And that applies to institutes, that applies to academia, that applies to major contractors, major designers. People who should, should know that these things are important and need to be stood up for. <coughs> so that's the rant over and I've got 15 minutes to go. So, just a sign of how we were. Anybody here that remembers 8-track cassettes? Yes, we've got a few takers. Um, how about the ZX Spectrum? Anybody, anybody remember that? Commodore 64, that sort of touch. 
So moving quickly down this, we can see that technology in our lifetime, if you're a baby boomer, born mid-50s onwards, you've seen all this stuff come and go. Facebook now, going just over 10 years, is, if it was a country, it would be the second or third largest in the world at about 1.2 billion users. And that's in less than 10 years, around about 10 years or so. A whole world of information is available to us on a global scale down to an individual scale. And it puts us in touch with all sorts of people. You know, and basically this digital data information is the spine to our lives now. And in one way, it, you can think of us as being as little individuals right at the bottom of all this stuff. But actually, it's like this. It puts you, as the individual, right at the heart of everything. Uh, you know, we have access to all this information 24-7, 365. In Dublin, outside uh, a hotel, there is this payphone. And we stayed there a couple of years ago when we went to the CETA conference. And it looks like that because of these. Imagine the, the effort that went into designing this thing. And it was made and it was installed perhaps just a few years ago. It was state of the art. It was brand spanking new. And some designer somewhere or product designer was really proud of it. And now it is totally obsolete. Because of the pace of change. Because of the stuff we're dealing with. Tax discs. I don't know whether you've got them over here, but, but we don't need them any in the UK anymore either. Because... Anybody with access to the right databases can access your registration number, can find out whether you've had your MOT, that's uh, so the safety test, whether you're insured, uh, when you, uh, whether you've got any convictions, um, and if they then start to aggregate, aggregate some big data, they can find out who you are, where you live, your underpants management, measurement, where you go on holiday, who you're married to, who your children are, and so on and so on and so on and so on. This is the digital world in which we live now. And anybody with the right tools can find out absolutely everything about you because we're leaving digital footprints everywhere through our transactions, our internet usage, our email, our texting, um, our use of debit cards, credit cards, all sorts of stuff. It's all out there. So anybody says, well, we're not living in a digital world, you know, you're living in Cloud Cookland. And this is just to show how, it ch how it's changed. This is the, uh, the general timeline above and where we are now in terms of the, the evolution of Apple over the last 30 years or so. I, I had a, uh, an Apple II in 1990. It had a 4 megabyte RAM and a 40 megabyte hard disk. I've got 64 gigs here. No, the command module of the, of the Apollo 11 uh, mission, the computer had uh, a RAM of something like uh, 16 kilobytes. And that got them to the moon and back. It's these things and iPods, around about the mid-2000s, 2005, 2006, that changed the music industry. Because with the advent of, uh, and this is probably the best example of the way digital transformation has changed in industry. Because basically, uh, the advent of iTunes, MP3 players, all that sort of stuff, revolutionised the way the music industry worked. It changed the economic model. Because it brought musicians and artists <laughs> much closer to their public who bought their songs and took out the way of them. And the construction industry will go just the same way. <coughs> because with the access of data, and technology to, to enable people to do all sorts of things. You know, I could be, I could be really controversial and say, why do I need a main contractor? If I'm a client, I've got the right skills, I've got the right team, I can send the information from my BIM model down the line to a CNC manufacturing facility, I can get somebody to do the groundwork, and I can have the stuff arrive on a lorry, and I can have it uh, uh, built by a team of technologists and uh, robots. And there are people doing that. 
Um, th there's a guy in China, we'll see a slide later if I get to it. Um, 3D printed 10 houses at a cost of about £3,000 a house. Done. Job done. Good. These are the sorts of challenges our industry with its muddy boots has got to get its head around. Because this is the way digital technology will transform our industry. And it's you guys that are still students now that are going to be really, really up to your necks and immersed in this stuff. And of course then, you see, BIM, you see, something we forget is that BIM isn't just about individual projects. BIM is about estates, it's about frameworks, it's about urban areas, it's about geographical areas, it's about infrastructure networks, it's about cities, it's about nations even. And all around the world, including the UK, there are examples of smart cities being built from scratch with sensors in everything. So bus stops and waste bins talking to each other, roads and traffic lights telling each other about the traffic flows, the weather conditions, um, people movements, looking at where there's crowding, queuing, all that sort of thing, uh, energy consumption, carbon emissions, all this stuff, data, uh, flowing all over the place. If you're familiar with the concept of the Internet of Everything or the Internet of Things, then there's something like, I don't know, 50, what is it, what's the target? Uh, forecast, something like 50 billion things connected to the Internet of Everything within 10 years. Trading information about all sorts of things. Down to the simplest thing is on your smartphone on the way home, making sure that the, your house fires up, up its systems so it's nice and warm and cosy by the time you get home and it's put the dinner in the oven at the same time. It can happen, it's happening. All this stuff is happening around us. And this is the challenge our industry has got to get its head around. And this is just, a, uh, in the UK we have PAS 181 which is now published, which is the Smart City Framework, which is about how effectively BIM fits into this picture. And here you'll see, we believe in enabling the ubiquitous digitisation of our city with connectivity and integration between people, places and things across the city. And the thing that makes that possible is BIM, because it joins everything up into this digital world on an urban national level, which is exactly where the level th three strategy is going because it places us now as a digitally enabled in industry in a much broader context. So, so really one of the key messages here that I'm trying to get across, and I hope, I hope I'm doing it, it is, is simply our lives are going digital and even more so over the, over the coming years. And it's, it's about working in this way. And because all this stuff is happening outside the industry in terms of uh, the way communities work and live, the increasing reliance, reliance on digital technology and all the things that goes with it, it is absolutely inevitable that our industry goes the same way as all the other industries have gone before us, like automotive, aerospace, um, petrochem, manufacturing, music, all sorts. Because we're increasingly re reliant on these things. And we're trading all those, this information every day. So basically, what we will see over the next few years is this Darwinian thing con continuing to kick in now. Where we see that organisations that don't take this on board, because of the benefits you can drive out of them, they will fail to keep up. The old ways of working are going to go and we have to face up to it. UK BIM Level 2 um, derives from the Government Construction Strategy published in 2011. Um, it was updated in the 2025 strategy. The targets were uh, revised and uh, made more challenging. But the interesting thing was this target came in which is the contribution of the construction industry to UK PLC GDP. You know, so, so basically, it's, again, 
It's putting the industry in a much broader context about the difference we make to UK PLC and people, we are exporting BIM to the world, you know, because people are beginning to follow the UK standards. Uh, if you follow BIM then you'll be familiar with this. Uh, this is just the levels of BIM as defined by Mark Buehler and Murray Richards. The green one is level two, which is basically, um, in a way, it's just the way we work now. We're still working in disciplines. It's a called a composite or federated environment. Uh, and we bring those federated models together and able to do stuff with them. Level three is a, an integrated environment. Uh, and it's still some, way, some years off in terms of uh, technical capability. But we can do all sorts of things in a digital environment because we can use these sorts of tools to do it. Probably the interesting thing is probably the action is in this sort of farm at the moment. I think every day almost you see something about 3D printing um, and rather like some guy IBM said um, 30, 30, 40 years ago, why would anybody want a computer at home? Well, who hasn't got a computer at home now? Or one of these things in their pocket? Uh, in the same sort of way, I think in a very short time, we'll all have little 3D printers at home. <coughs> and we'll print our clothes, we'll print uh, stuff for the house, we might even print our food. You'll just download it off the web, pay a subscription, bang. You know, and you'll have a tank of gunge outside or somewhere in the house that provides all the, all the gooey stuff for the 3D printer to do its job. Skanska are experimenting with Loughborough University to produce a, a 3D concrete printer. Because basically, imagine one of these big boys on site pumping out the parts to build it in your building and you just have tanks of goo arriving ever so often. Rather than shipping the stuff from China and your carbon, dealing with your carbon footprint, actually have a big industrial size printer on site actually churning out the stuff for your building. Which, funnily enough, if you remember the Bison Warframe system, which was used for um, the mass housing in the 60s in the UK, that's exactly what they did. They had manufacturing plants on site producing precast concrete panels. You know, they had big cranes and doing stuff. And this is exactly the same. And I, th I think very shortly we'll have really big industrial sized printers mounted on the back of articulated lorries and they'll just go from side to side pumping the stuff out. The other thing is around, around sort of automated construction. There, there is, Lang O'Rourke has a semi-automated bricklayer, bricklaying robot. So if you're a bricklayer, watch out. Um, and if you're a building control officer, um, already I can, I can put um, the BIM models into something like Solibri and I can do a building regulations compliance check. I think the next generation of BIM platforms that we will see come out will be a bit more intuitive and, and more intelligent. So the whole issue of compliance will almost be a self-regulating thing where the software will guide you into designing things that are compliant. Like, uh -uh, that door is too close to the first rise on the staircase. Because anything that can be rule based can be programmed, you can turn it into an algorithm and that's what we'll have. Um, in Singapore they've been doing it for decade, at least a decade now where actually you submit your planning application online, you get, you get a decision uh, within 30 minutes, you, you, send, you send them your BIM model, they check it against their urban BIM model and bang, done. In the UK, it can take anything up to three months and more to get planning permission. So again, planning officers watch out as well. There we go. Anyway, so there you go. Um, UK BIM Level 2 is defined by these two documents. You can find them all on the uh, uh, task group website. Um, the most notable uh, recent edition is this one, Pazanet 2 Part 5 which has literally just been published, I think, um, earlier early this year or late last year, uh, which is about digital and cyber security. And that probably, irrespective of whatever process we're working to, whatever standard, it doesn't matter so much. But actually, this is a really fundamental question now. 
how safe is your data? You know, if there is a server failure overnight, what are you going to do? What are your clients going to do? Can you be sued? Does your PI cover you for that? Because I'd go and check. Because we have, there's already been instances of hacking into building um, BMS systems using uh, Trojan viruses. The ISS has been, the International Space Station has been hacked. Um, some hackers took over uh, an Iranian nuclear power station, the building management system, a few years ago using a bug called Stuxnet. Stuxnet. Um, and they took over the uranium centrifuges or something, which doesn't sound too clever to me. But anyway, so, so it's out there. And as we keep putting more and more stuff into the cloud, this is going to become much more of an issue. So check your data. Those are the key level two outputs that you get. So we need a process. We need a way of dealing with non-graphical data, which is code We'll still have drawings, because in a level two environment, we still form as you can track using drawings anyway. You'll need a commercial suite, uh, so a contract or a BIM, con BIM contract addendum like the BIM protocol. And also, you'll probably exchange some 3D models, some geometry as either native formats or the sort of equivalent of a PDF. So, if I just do a quick cut and run, Martin, is that okay? So, change is a constant. I'm hoping you're getting that message. So, you need to run faster. Um, if you're worried about what you're doing now, I'd like to introduce you to this guy. Um, Ian Qureshi. He's the youngest certified Microsoft professional in the world, and he is five or six. And he makes, he codes, he programs, he's built his own computer network at home. He is one of the new millennials, and this is the guy, and the kids like him, to be afraid of. Because if you're worried about your job now, they're coming over the hill. And this is the, uh, the th remember I talked about the 3D printing? Uh, this is another example. Ten houses in a single day. Great fun. Uh, so what next? I think, I think the interesting thing for me is, uh, it's almost like, I imagine the industry over here is no different in a lot of ways. Um, I think we're almost in the middle of a perfect storm. We're, on, we're under assault, attack, on a whole variety of levels. Uh, but there's also a lot of things going on as well, because I think basically, and we're already seeing it already, um, we're mo becoming much more mobile in our use of technology. The sale of mobile chips for devices is now outselling sort of desktop-based static chips. So clearly, we're, you know, mobile technology is becoming much more powerful, much more accessible. The whole field BIM thing is, is really beginning to take off now. Uh, we're going to be, re if we're connected now, we're going to be connected even more. Um, there's all sorts of different uh, technologies coming through, like AMA, automated manufacture and um, assembly. So the idea of having uh, BIM-driven manufacturing plants that send their components to BIM-driven assembly robots is already happening in some, to some respect, even to the extent of using drones to go around sites to check progress and then to upload that into a BIM model so I can see in green and red how, how life is going on site. Technologies, you know, once graphene and things like that start kicking into the industry, very light, very strong, all these sorts of things that can be manipulated. Um, but the interesting thing is, I think even now, you know, we, we, we talk about roles in industry and institutions, and it's like people are, please don't change, please don't change. Let's keep things just the way they were. Well, it won't be, will it? You know, and I think basically, if industry, sorry, if institutions um, and CIB people, leaders, keep your ears shut at this point. If 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 um, if institutes and academia don't keep up, the needs of industry will leave them behind. Because I I believe actually 
The driver for change is the, are the younger generations coming through because they just won't accept the way we work in this industry anymore. And also industry needs to feed the machine. So if they need skilled workers and institutes and uh, academia can't keep up, they'll do it themselves. It's, it's a Darwinian force, a Darwinian thing we're dealing with here. And it's an evolution of a scale that we've never seen in the industry. That's why it's the third industrial revolution. This is about the information economy and the way it's going to change the way we work forever. <coughs> and if you don't keep up, you will be toast. So that's simple. And I think we will see job roles and patterns change. We will see a lot more overlapping because the technology and the access to it and the skills democratizes the process. So, actually, if I as a client have the right skills or can buy the skills and I can get designs in a library off the web and I can parcel up my BIM model to send it to subcontractors and I can um, use perhaps programming software and a bit of, a bit of expertise, I can have a very lean team that delivers my project for me and I may not necessarily need all the traditional roles in it because it works for me, I have the information, I have it at my fingertips. Anyway, and it's these sorts of things that we need to get our heads around because it's going to change very rapidly within the next decade because the people that embrace this stuff, they're going to be way over there and the rest of us are going to be eating dust. And BIM is one of the levers, but if we think of a lens if we think of a lens in terms of BIM, common data environments, lean thinking, integrated methods of procurement, design for manufacture. So this is where we are and this is where we might be. You know, so I think the roles change, institutions should change, I think they have to. Um, and also a left field player could come in. Imagine if Google or Apple did construction. They're not worried about traditional roles. They're not worried about traditional ways of thinking. People, because we're working in a digital environment, people who use digital information, whoever they are, if they understand how to use information and data, they can do this stuff. So be afraid. Because actually, there's an increasing trend of uh, companies hiring information specialists or IT specialists, not necessarily traditional construction professionals. So things to look out for, final, final slide. Martin's released. Things to look out for, if, if you haven't caught up with it yet, um, get a subscription to Wired magazine because you know, you'll read this stuff in here. But Internet of Things, Internet of Everything, Absolutely amazing trend growing all the time because that's again plugging our industry in the urban and built environment into a much broader context. Smart city movement, um, the, the advancements in mobile and cloud connected computing and accessing software and all that sort of stuff. And then of course big data. Now if you look at the way the retailers apply big data, just imagine that being applied to the construction industry in terms of looking at say performance of contractors or subcontractors or particular components, or pricing of certain things, or whatever. Now, the, the ability to aggregate data and information from all sorts of sources can provide some very interesting um, <coughs> reviews and analysis. And then also, we'll see a lot of convergence and crossover between industries and technologies. So, like 3D printing is being used by surgeons to create prosthetics, to replace parts of people's skull. Um, the US Navy are using, using effectively BIM and 3D printing to replace spare parts on ships at sea. There's even a 3D printer in the International Space Station now for exactly the same reason. So it's, it's all over the place. Just got to look for it. And of course, there's the general stuff on technology as well. So, um, so keep your eyes open. It's all going to change. And you guys at the back, um, it's, it's totally in your system. And I hope by the time you get to mid-career, our industry is going to be a lot better. Otherwise, we just won't exist.
Thank you very much.